now more than ever, today's believer who wants to stay informed on today's religious movements and scriptural insights needs to subscribe to the Christian Research Journal. Here's what you'll find in the latest issue of the Christian Research Journal. The Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. profoundly changed America with his nonviolent resistance to racial segregation and discrimination, but his philosophy and theology include some dubious beliefs and influences. In this installment of our Philosophers series, we consider how evangelicals should view this complicated African-American leader whose birthday is now marked by a national holiday. In this issue, you'll also find insightful articles on the biblical view of divorce and remarriage. How should Christians handle tithing in the current economic climate, the internet mission field, and all of our regular features that you've come to enjoy. Call CRI and start your subscription today, 888-7000-CRI. You'll also see it online at equip.org. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us now to pray. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. The Lord's Prayer. We can rattle it off by heart. But at the same time, how many of us now struggle in our prayer life, searching for an intimate fellowship with God? As human beings, we want instant success, instant formulas, but God wants something else. He wants intimate fellowship. Begin your personal, fulfilling prayer life with the Lord. Get your copy of The Prayer of Jesus by Hank Hanegraaff. Call the Christian Research Institute and order The Prayer of Jesus, 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-CRI. You'll also find it on our website. Just go to www.equip.org. Can there be any greater joy than to commune in the secret place with the living God? Welcome to a special edition of the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Today, we continue our special presentation of Hank Hanegraaff's The Prayer of Jesus. Many believe the prayer of Jesus is Hank's greatest and most beloved work. Our prayer is that it will be a guide to help you find an intimate connection with God and that you'll see Him in a new light because of it. Recently, by rereading The Prayer of Jesus, Hank's passion for prayer was reignited and he wants you to have that same joy and passion, a desire for an intimate relationship with your Creator. Hi, I'm Lee Strobel. One of the great discoveries that I encountered when I began to apply the prayer of Jesus to my life is that I was sort of praying backwards. I was coming first to God with my requests, and then with any time left over, maybe taking some time to build my relationship with God, and yet Jesus flips that around. And he opens up the prayer of Jesus by talking about how it is that we can build a relationship first with the creator of the universe. And then that sets the stage for the request that we can make to him in the context of a relationship with him. Our Father in heaven. To the disciples, the first words of the prayer of Jesus must have been nothing short of scandalous. Of all the things they had ever learned about prayer, this was certainly not one of them. They were not even permitted to say the name of God out loud, yet alone refer to him as our Father. Yet that is precisely how Jesus taught his disciples to pray. There was, however, a catch. As John explains, only those who received Jesus and believed in his name had the right to refer to God as our Father. In fact, Jesus made it clear that there are only two kinds of people in this world, those who should refer to Satan as our father and those who may refer to God as our father. There are no other options. In one sense, Jesus is the only one who can legitimately address God as father, for he is the unique son of God and has been so throughout eternity. However, as Paul explains in Romans 8, Those who are led by the Spirit of God are no longer illegitimate children. Instead, they too are sons and daughters by adoption through faith in Jesus. Thus, they can legitimately refer to God as our Father. Jesus continues the pattern by teaching his disciples to qualify the phrase, Our Father, with the words, In heaven. In doing so, he is teaching us that God transcends time and space. We can address him with intimacy, but never with impudence. He is the sovereign creator, 
and we are but sinful creatures. Addressing God as our Father makes us ever mindful of our relationship with Him. It also underscores the fact that I do not come before Him in isolation. Rather, I come as part of a community of faith. Thus, adding the phrase in heaven reminds us of the reverence due His name. Hallowed be your name. The initial request of the prayer of Jesus is that God's name be made holy. To pray, hallowed be your name, is to put emphasis on God first, exactly where it belongs. Our daily lives should radiate a far greater commitment to God's nature and holiness than our needs. To pray, hallowed be your name, is to pray that God be given the unique reverence that His holiness demands, and that God's word be preached without corruption, that Our churches be led by faithful pastors and preserved from false prophets, and that we be kept from language that profanes God's name, that our thought lives remain holy, and that we cease from seeking honor for ourselves and seek instead that God's name be glorified. In the words of St. Augustine, this is prayed for not as if the name of God were not holy already, but that it may be held holy by men. In other words, that God may become so known to them that they shall reckon nothing more holy and nothing that they are more afraid of offending. Our monikers and meager attempts at ministry are meaningless unless God's name is magnified. Where God is not respected, it is inevitable that we, his image bearers, will also suffer a lack of respect. The glorious truth of this petition is that while we were once impotent to hallow his name, God has hallowed us through the sacrifice of the very one who taught us these words. Once his light shining into our darkness would have been terrifying. But like Isaiah, he has touched our lips with a burning coal and whispers through our pain. Your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. Puritan writer Thomas Watson assured us that while some petitions are locked in time, this one is timeless. When some of the other petitions shall be useless and out of date, we shall not need to pray in heaven give us our daily bread because there'll be no more sin, nor lead us into temptation because the old serpent is not there to tempt, yet hallowing of God's name will be of great use and request in heaven. We shall be ever singing hallelujahs, which is nothing else but the hallowing of God's name. The City of God Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Matthew 6.10 The phrase, your kingdom come, is gilded with such gold and glory that I scarcely know where to begin. I almost feel like I'm at Disney World with my kids and... I don't know which exhibit or ride will cause their eyes to sparkle more. Knowing that, in these few precious moments with you, I am unable to fully mine the vast storehouse of treasure locked up in this phrase, I can but console myself in praying that we together will spend the rest of our lives wandering through its vastness, enjoying its wisdom and its wealth. To my kids, the magic kingdom is heaven on earth. (laughs) To me, it's more like eternal conscious torment. I love to see the smiles on their faces, but standing in line hour after hour in suffocating heat has left me wondering if that might well be what hell is like. (laughs) One thing's for certain. As far as I'm concerned, the Magic Kingdom is definitely not heaven on earth. Heaven once did exist on earth, however, but it didn't last long. The first human being sinned and succeeded in dooming the planet. The rest of history has been a war between two kingdoms. In the city of God, Augustine describes these kingdoms as the kingdom of God and the kingdom of man. Each of these two kingdoms has its own ruler, its own people, its own desire, and its own destiny. In the fullness of time, God sent his Son into the world to overthrow the devil's domain by driving out demons performing miracles, preaching the good news of the coming kingdom, and ultimately sacrificing himself upon a cross. While Jesus came to establish an eternal kingdom, his subjects merely wanted an earthly king who would overthrow their enemies by military might. 
Thus, when the Savior said, My kingdom is not of this world, the shouts of Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel, changed to screams of, Crucify him! Crucify him! We have no king but Caesar! They wanted an earthly king who would expand their earthly territory. Jesus, however, had come to take his rightful place upon the throne of their lives. In teaching us to pray, Your kingdom come, Jesus was first and foremost teaching us to petition our Heavenly Father to expand his rule over the territory of our hearts. It is an invitation to embrace the kingdom of Christ in every aspect of our lives. Like Jabez Stone in The Devil and Daniel Webster, we are called to renounce our deal with the devil and pledge our allegiance to expand his kingdom rather than expanding our own. Furthermore, to pray, Your kingdom come, is to pray that God would use our witness for the expansion of his kingdom. C.S. Lewis describes this world as enemy-occupied territory and describes Christianity as the story of how the rightful king has landed in disguise and is now calling all of us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. And finally, to pray, Your kingdom come, is to recognize that Christ has already won the war, but that the reality of his reign has not yet fully been realized. At present, we're sandwiched between the triumph of the cross and the termination of time, between D-Day and V-Day. D-Day was the first coming of Christ when the enemy was decisively defeated. V-Day is the second coming of Christ when the enemy shall totally and finally surrender. This point is driven home by a comparison to the Nazi occupation of Norway. Hitler had occupied Norway, but in 1945 it was liberated. Suppose for a moment that up in the most inaccessible north, some small village with a Nazi overlord failed to hear the news of the liberation for a number of weeks. During that time, we might put it that the inhabitants of the village were living in the old time of Nazi occupation instead of the new time of Norwegian liberation. Likewise, any person who now lives in a world that has been liberated from the tyranny of evil powers, either in ignorance of or in indifference to what Christ has done, is precisely in the position of those Norwegians to whom the good news of deliverance had failed to penetrate. Do you ever find yourself in such a hurry that you come to God in prayer with a list of requests and before your knees ever touch the ground, you're already thinking about the next thing you need to do? Many Christians struggle to have a meaningful and effective prayer life, but so often we get it backwards. We want a relationship with God, but without investing any time into that relationship. Well, Jesus' model for prayer revolutionized the lives of his disciples, and it can revolutionize yours as well. The Prayer of Jesus by Hank Hanegraaff is not just another book about prayer. It's a journey to discover the secrets to real intimacy with God. Available for your gift to the Christian Research Institute when you call 888-7000-CRI. That translates to 888-7000-274. Or visit us online at equip.org. You can also write to us at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28271. And don't go away. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is coming back shortly with more of the Prayer of Jesus. From Genesis to Revelation, Every word of the New King James Bible is performed in dramatic audio theater by over 500 actors and narrated by Michael York. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. With sound design by one of the top studios in the industry and scored with original music composed and conducted by Maestro Stefano Manetti. The Word of Promise Audio Bible puts the listener in the moment when Moses leads the children of Israel, Daniel walks into the lion's den, and when Jesus lives as man here on earth. 
Order the Word of Promise audio Bible on CD or MP3 from CRI by calling 888-7274 or online at equip.org. Investors are concerned that there's more bad news. Calling for an end to U.S. military operations. The world is glued to the news headlines, anxiously awaiting what the future holds. So it's up to believers in Christ to be prepared to give well-reasoned answers about what lies ahead, based on sound Bible doctrine. That's why The Apocalypse Code by Hank Hanegraaff is such a vital resource for your library. It covers today's most asked prophecy questions and reveals why answering them correctly matters so much in today's world. The Apocalypse Code will resolve many questions regarding the mysteries of the end times and help you give an informed answer for the hope that is in you. All you really need to know about understanding Revelation is what the rest of the Bible says. So order your copy of The Apocalypse Code by Hank Hanegraaff. To order, call 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-CRI. Or look online at equip.org. Set sail for a week at sea with the Bible Answer Man, Hank Hanegraaff and the Word. This coming May 9th through May 16th, 2010. The seven-day Western Caribbean cruise departs from Tampa, Florida and sails to four beautiful Caribbean ports like Grand Cayman, Belize, and Cozumel aboard the luxurious Carnival Legend. Enjoy a time of great fellowship and daily teaching from God's Word with Hank. Grammy Award-winning Christian musician Steve Camp leads worship. The topic throughout our week will be The Word as we explore the unfathomable riches of the God-breathed scriptures and how we can apply these great truths to our lives. To participate in this event, you must register with our friends at Sovereign Cruises. Starting at just $599, cabins are going quickly. So register soon by calling 877-768-2784, extension 101, or by going online to equip.org. Learn to have a real relationship with the lover of your soul with Hank Hanegraaff's The Prayer of Jesus. Available on audio CD or in paperback with study guide as a thank you for your gift to the Christian Research Institute when you visit us on the web at equip.org. You can also call our resource consultants at 888-7000-CRI. Now let's return to the host of the Bible Answer Man broadcast, Hank Hanegraaff, and our special presentation of the prayer of Jesus. History is hurtling towards a glorious and climactic end when the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. Jesus not only taught the Apostle John to pray, your kingdom come, but he also gave him a glimpse of that kingdom on the Isle of Patmos. Says John, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. On that day, heaven will once again exist on earth. Your will be done. Everyone is familiar with the word amen, but have you ever taken the time to consider what it really means? Amen is a universally recognized word that is far more significant than simply signing off and saying, that's all. <laughs> with the word amen, we are in effect saying, may it be so in accordance with the will of God. It is a marvelous reminder that any discussion on prayer must begin with the understanding that prayer is a means of bringing us into conformity with God's will, not a magic mantra that ensures God's conformity to ours. Jesus is the very personification of the word Amen. In Revelation, he is referred to as the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. And he not only taught us to pray, your will be done, he modeled these words in his life. In his passionate prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane, he prayed, My Father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. While Jesus may be our greatest example, 
he is certainly not our only example. His brother James warns those who are prone to boast and brag that they ought to pray instead, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. Christ's closest friend during his earthly ministry, the Apostle John, echoes the words of the Master when he writes, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. Likewise, the Apostle Paul earnestly prayed that, by God's will, he might have the opportunity to visit the believers in Rome and encourage the believers in Rome to pray that, by God's will, he might come to visit them. To pray your will be done is first and foremost, then, a recognition of the sovereignty of God. In effect, it's a way of saying, Thank God this world is under His control and not mine. We would be in deep trouble if God gave us everything we asked for. The truth is, we simply don't know what's best for us. As Dr. Gordon Fee has well said, Our asking is based on our own limited knowledge, and all too often it is colored by our own self-interest. We can only praise God that He does not answer every prayer prayed in faith. Hezekiah, after all, had his prayer answered and was granted 15 more years. But it was during those years that Manasseh was born. In retrospect, if Hezekiah had known, as God knew, that in those 15 additional years he would father the most wicked king in the history of Judah, position his kingdom for plunder by the Babylonians, and end up dying with his heart lifted up in pride, he may well have added to the words of his prayer, Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. Furthermore, to pray your will be done is daily recognition that our wills must be submitted to his will. One of the most comforting thoughts that can penetrate a human mind yielded to the will of God is that he who created us also knows what's best for us. Thus, if we walk according to His will, rather than trying to command Him according to our wills, we will indeed have, as He promised, not a panacea, but peace in the midst of the storm. In the yielded life, there is a great peace in knowing that the one who taught us to pray, Your will be done, has every detail of our lives under control. Not only is he the object of our faith, he is the originator of our faith. Indeed, he is the originator of our salvation, and yes, even the originator of our prayers. Thus, whatever we pray for, whether it's healing or a house, when our will is in harmony with his will, we will receive what we request 100% of the time. However, when we pray earnestly as Christ prayed, nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done, we can rest assured that even in sickness and tragedy, all things work together for good to those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Finally, to pray your will be done is daily recognition that God will not spare us from trial and tribulation, but rather will use the fiery furnace to purge impurities from our lives. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, well known as the Prince of Preachers, was severely afflicted with gout. It's a condition that sometimes brings on excruciating pain. And in a sermon published in 1881, he wrote, Were you ever in the melting pot, dear friends? I have been there, and my sermon's with me. The result of melting is that we arrive at a true valuation of things, and we are poured out into a new and better fashion. And, oh, we may almost wish for the melting pot, if we may but get rid of the dross, if we may but be pure, if we may but be fashioned more completely like unto our Lord. Spurgeon did not live a long, robust life. In fact, it may be well said that he had everything except his health. At age 57, he died. Yet while he lived, he made his life count. For he is history's most widely read preacher. His sermon series stands as the largest set of books by a single author in the history of the Christian church. Spurgeon's life bears eloquent testimony that the tragedy is not in dying young, but in living large and never using your life for eternal significance. Ultimately, this is the message of the book of Job. Job 
endured more tragedy in a single day than most people experience in a lifetime. Yet, in his darkest hour, Job would utter the ultimate words of faith, Though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. When we reach the end of this majestic literary masterpiece, we finally understand, like a refreshing drink of water on a dry, dusty day, our thirst for answers is quenched. He is sovereign, we are not. In this world you will have trouble, disease, decay, disorder, discouragement, and even death are the natural consequences of a fallen world. But as our master so eloquently put it, take heart. I have overcome the world. For the child of God, the hope is not perfect health and happiness in this lifetime. It's a resurrected body and a heavenly dwelling in the life to come. On earth as it is in heaven. One quick point before we move on. As we pray, we must ever be mindful that the phrase in heaven is inextricably woven together with each of the first three petitions of the prayer of Jesus. We begin by praying that the name of our Father in heaven be hallowed. We continue by praying, Your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And we conclude with the words, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. This, of course, is not an accident. Rather, it is a daily reminder that we are to live with heaven in mind. As we launch into the last three petitions of the prayer of Jesus, in which the Master teaches us how to bring our request to God, we should never lose sight of our priorities. R.C. Sproul, in his inimitable style, makes the point. He says, we do not come rushing into God's presence arrogantly, assaulting Him with our petty requests, forgetting whom we are addressing. We are to make certain that we have properly exalted the God of creation. Only after God has been rightly honored, adored, and exalted do the subsequent petitions of God's people assume their proper place. The prayer of Jesus is divided into essentially two parts. The first is focused on God's glory. Thus we pray, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done. The second is focused on our needs. From this point on, we will pray for ourselves, for our provision, our pardon and our protection. It is the third petition that brings the Lord's Prayer down to earth, making the transition from our Father up in heaven to his children down on earth. In the words of the great church father Tertullian, how gracefully has the divine wisdom arranged the order of the prayer so that after things heavenly, that is, after the name of God, the will of God, and the kingdom of God, it should then give earthly necessities also room for a petition. The first step towards intimacy with God is to make prayer a priority. Once we grasp the significance of a dialogue with God, prayer will no longer be a mere duty or discipline. It will become a delight, for it is the very means for bringing us into the presence of the living God. The Prayer of Jesus, Secrets to Intimacy with God, is the perfect tool to jumpstart your prayer life and put you on the road to experiencing intimacy with God like never before. You can request your copy of the audiobook or softcover edition with study guide on our website at equip.org or by calling our resource consultants at 888-7000-CRI. We'll be back with more of the Bible Answer Man broadcast right after this short break. I want to go back to the phone lines. We'll talk to John listening on KFAX. Hi, John. Hello, Hank. Thanks for taking my call. You've always appreciated the thoughtful, biblically-based answers you hear from Hank on the Bible Answer Man. Now you can benefit from Hank's input and instruction in your personal quiet times through the Legacy Study Bible. Hank Hanegraaff has assembled what could be the most helpful Bible you've ever read. Each book of the Bible begins with an introduction written by Hank, which means for each book you'll learn it's L-E-G-A-C-Y or location, essence, genre, author, context, and years. The entire Bible is crafted so that you can document your legacy of faith. It's like including Hank in your Bible studies. 
Order the Legacy Study Bible edited by Hank Hanegraaff by calling 888-7000-CRI or online at www.equip.org. Don't forget to ask about the personalized edition. Again, that's equip.org. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us now to pray. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth. The Lord's Prayer. We can rattle it off by heart. But at the same time, how many of us now struggle in our prayer life, searching for an intimate fellowship with God? As human beings, we want instant success, instant formulas, but God wants something else. He wants intimate fellowship. Begin your personal, fulfilling prayer life with the Lord. Get your copy of The Prayer of Jesus by Hank Hanegraaff. Call the Christian Research Institute and order The Prayer of Jesus, 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-CRI. You'll also find it on our website. Just go to www.equip.org. Can there be any greater joy than to commune in the secret place with the living God? Welcome back to this special presentation of The Prayer of Jesus. You can request your copy of the audiobook or soft cover edition with study guide on our website at equip.org. That's equip.org or by calling our resource consultants at 888-7000-CRI. We now return to The Prayer of Jesus. Hi, I'm Lee Strobel. Not long after I became a Christian, my wife came up to me one day. She was all excited. She said, look what I found in the Bible, Lee. It says we should pray for the desires of our heart. And I thought, this is unbelievable. Not only does God, as a gift of his grace, give us eternal life, not only does he say you can commune with the God of the universe, you can get to know me, you can experience me, but then on top of that and flowing out of that relationship with him, we can then bring him our requests. Bible says, ask and you will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. And it just makes sense, doesn't it, that Jesus would first say, let's build our relationship with the Heavenly Father. And then out of that, bring him the requests of your heart. It's just like if you have a son or a daughter and you have a relationship with that child. And it's very natural for you to bring that child into your presence, bring that son or daughter up on your lap and say, what is it that you need? What is it that you want? And then as a parent, in your wisdom, you provide those things which ultimately will accrue to your child's best interests. Well, Jesus taught his disciples that yes, there is an appropriate time. Yes, it is legitimate to bring our request to God. And Hank is going to talk about the teachings of Jesus in that regard. Bringing our request. Give us today our daily bread. Matthew 6, 11. Remember the scene from Luke 11? Jesus had just returned from one of his private prayer sessions, his face awash with the glory of his Father's presence. The disciples immediately encircle him. One of them, perhaps Peter, verbalizes the words, but they were all thinking the same thing. Lord, he says in a voice mixed with urgency and anticipation, Whatever it is you experience when you disappear for those long stretches and pray, we really want to know about it. Jesus smiles. The time had come for him to unveil the principles of prayer to his disciples. And as usual, he begins with a story. Pointing to Peter, he says, Imagine going to your neighbor's house at midnight and asking him if you can borrow three loaves of bread. <laughs> a smile breaks out on Thomas's face. He can't help but chuckle at the irony of the bread of life telling a story about borrowing bread. Your neighbor is fast asleep, Jesus continues. So you pound on the door frantically and you shout, wake up, I need your help. A friend of mine has just shown up on my doorstep and my cupboard is bare. Jesus cups his hands around his mouth for effect. Don't bother me, a neighbor yells back. I've locked up the house, my kids are in bed, I can't help you right now. Peter wasn't very good at keeping a poker face. His thoughts might just as well have been three-inch neon letters flashing across his forehead. Yeah, right, he murmured to himself. This guy can't help or won't. James and John locked eyes knowingly. If Peter knocked on my door in the middle of the night, they were each thinking, I wouldn't get up either. I tell you the truth, 
Jesus explained. If Peter had just kept banging on that door, his neighbor would have given him bread, not so much because he was a good neighbor, but because of Peter's persistence. The disciples had begun to fidget. They didn't quite understand what Jesus was driving at. So Jesus continues, So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. If your grumpy neighbor offers aid as a result of persistence, if only to keep you from continuing to bother him, how much more will your heavenly Father, who is righteous and loving, come to your aid when you ask? Some of the disciples were beginning to catch the meaning of the parable. Peter couldn't help himself. I get it, I get it, I get it, I get it. He shouted, his voice echoing throughout the canyon. You're contrasting my grumpy neighbor with God. James and John and the rest of the disciples now caught the full force of the meaning as well. Jesus was not comparing Peter's neighbor to God. He was contrasting the neighbor's grumpiness and the neighbor's resistance with God's goodness and with God's readiness to help. Jesus had just offered his disciples what is known as a lesser to greater argument for trusting God in prayer. If the lesser individual, in this case the grumpy neighbor, was in the end willing to help a hungry man even for a less than noble reason, how much more will our gracious Heavenly Father respond when we humbly come before him and ask him for our daily bread? Give us today our daily bread. Jesus does not want to leave his disciples wondering whether or not they have properly perceived the points of his parable. So he continues, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Jesus had just intensified the force of his story by moving from a relationship between neighbors to a relationship between a father and his child. And the message was beginning to resonate with the disciples. They'd been conditioned to think that God was unapproachable, so if they did ask him for anything, they had better make it snappy. Jesus, however, tells them that God cares for them as a father cares for his own dear children. When we ask for such essentials as our daily bread, our Heavenly Father will not turn His relationship with us into an illusion by giving us something harmful, like a scorpion or a snake. Jesus puts an exclamation point on the parable by drawing the attention of His disciples to the greatest gift of all, the gift of the precious Holy Spirit. As the Holy Spirit is an all-encompassing gift, so too we are reminded that petitioning our Heavenly Father to give us today our daily bread encompasses far more than food. As the great 16th century theologian Martin Chemnitz once put it, the word bread in this petition encompasses all things belonging to and necessary for the sustenance of this body and life. Chemnitz goes on to underscore the fact that biblically the word bread in the context of the prayer of Jesus, can be rightly understood in a larger sense as all those things that are required for the necessary, peaceable, and honest ordering of this life. This applies to the nation, the family, the productivity of the ground, profitable weather, and so on. Note carefully the word necessary. God promises to provide the necessities, but not always the niceties, or as has been well said, our needs, not our greeds. And we should want it no other way. With the proverbial teacher Augur, we should pray, give me neither poverty nor riches, but give me only my daily bread. Otherwise, I may have too much and disown you and say, who is the Lord? Or I may become poor and steal, and so dishonor the name of my God. Furthermore, when we ask our Heavenly Father to give us today our daily bread, we are praying in plural. Not only are we praying for the needs of our immediate family, but we are praying for the needs of our extended family as well. We do not pray as mere rugged individualists, but as members of a community of faith. 
Just a few moments ago, I finished wolfing down a takeout meal from California Pizza Kitchen. <laughs> All that was left were two slices of freshly baked bread. Since I'd been writing for over a week with no exercise, I hardly dared take another bite. So I walked into my office, and I gave the bread to someone passing by. Well, that was hardly a sacrifice, but it did serve as a subtle reminder that we cannot rightly pray give and not be givers ourselves. In Luke chapter 12, Jesus tells a there are no moving vans following Hearst's story. <laughs> God had richly blessed a man, but his priorities were all out of whack. His rhetoric about his fortune was laced with self-interest. My produce, my goods, my, my, my. There was nothing wrong with how he had gained his wealth, no hint of impropriety or immorality. The problem was that he had purposed in his heart to take life easy, to eat, drink, and be merry. And in the process, he had become insensitive to the needs of others. Jesus' condemnation was not only crisp and clear, it was downright chilling. You fool, he said, this very night your life will be demanded of you. Finally, when Jesus taught his disciples to pray, Give us today our daily bread. He was reminding them that he was there to sustain them spiritually as well as physically. Each time we partake of communion, we are reminded that he is the bread of life. As Philip Graham Ryken rightly reminds us, when we receive communion, the bread on the table is physical bread, but it also has a spiritual meaning. The bread is an aftertaste of salvation. It reminds us of the body that was given for our sins on the cross. It is also a foretaste of the kingdom to come when we sit down with Jesus at his eternal banquet and eat the bread of heaven. If you've ever had a friend who only talks to you when he needs to borrow something but was never really there when you needed a friend, you know the pain of not having a real connection and missing out on what could be a great friendship. Likewise, God laments when we bring our request to Him without first building our relationship with Him. Learn to have a real relationship with the lover of your soul with Hank Hanegraaff's The Prayer of Jesus, available on audio CD or in paperback with study guide as a thank you for your gift to the Christian Research Institute when you visit us on the web at equip.org or call our resource consultants at 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-274. And do remember this ministry is only possible with the generous financial support of listeners like you. Don't go away, we'll be right back with more of the prayer of Jesus. Master the defense of the resurrection in minutes and remember it for a lifetime with the latest release of the Hankronym series, Resurrection, Memorable Keys to the Greatest Feat in History. The resurrection of Jesus Christ is not merely important to the historic Christian faith. Without it, there would be no Christianity. To make the facts of the resurrection memorable and easily referenced, Hank has developed the Hankronym Feet and created the second in a series of specifically designed flip charts. Laminated, tabbed, and sized to fit in your pocket, this incredible tool will allow you to defend the truth of the resurrection on a moment's notice. Available for your gift to the Christian Research Institute when you call 888-7000-CRI or when you go online to equip.org. One of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us now to pray. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth. The Lord's Prayer. We can rattle it off by heart. But at the same time, how many of us now struggle in our prayer life, searching for an intimate fellowship with God? As human beings, we want instant success, instant formulas, but God wants something else. He wants intimate fellowship. 
Begin your personal fulfilling prayer life with the Lord. Get your copy of The Prayer of Jesus by Hank Hanegraaff. Call the Christian Research Institute and order The Prayer of Jesus, 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-CRI. You'll also find it on our website. Just go to www.equip.org. Can there be any greater joy than to commune in the secret place with the living God? Hank Hanegraaff has answered thousands of questions while hosting the Bible Answer Man broadcast. Now, the complete Bible Answer Book Collector's Edition offers concise and well-crafted answers to over 170 questions that stumble seekers and galvanize skeptics against the historic Christian faith. This beautiful leather hardbound edition contains all the questions and answers from the Bible Answer Book Volumes 1 and 2, plus all new answers to some of today's tenacious questions such as, Does Mormonism really teach that Jesus is the spirit brother of Satan? And did Jesus make a crucial historical blunder in the Gospel of Mark? And that's not all. With each entry, Hank offers scripture references specifically related to the subject matter and recommends resources for further study to better equip you. Get your copy of this attractive 550-page leather hardbound book when you call 888-7000-CRI or order on our secure website at www.equip.org. That's equip.org. And don't forget to ask about the personalized edition. We're back with this special presentation of The Prayer of Jesus by Hank Hanegraaff. Do you ever find yourself in such a hurry that you come to God in prayer with a list of requests and before your knees ever touch the ground, you're already thinking about the next thing you need to do? Many Christians struggle to have a meaningful and effective prayer life, but so often we get it backwards. We want a relationship with God without investing any time into that relationship. Well, Jesus' model for prayer revolutionized the lives of his disciples, and it can revolutionize yours as well. The Prayer of Jesus by Hank Hanegraaff is not just another book about prayer. It's a journey to discover the secrets to real intimacy with God. Available for your gift to the Christian Research Institute when you call 888-7000-CRI or visit us online at equip.org. That's equip.org. We now return to the Prayer of Jesus. I remember when Hank emailed me the Prayer of Jesus and said, Lee, finally the book is done. And I read it and I said, Hank, this is terrific. You've done a wonderful job of helping people understand how they can apply principles of Jesus in their everyday prayer life and grow strong and solid in their relationship with God. But then I said, Hank, I think something's missing. I think you maybe need one more chapter that deals in very practical ways about how people can take these principles and inculcate them daily into their prayer life. And as we looked at it together, he said, you know, maybe you're right. And I'm so glad he sat down and did this one last chapter because I think he did a terrific job of helping give practical ideas to take these principles of prayer and to make them come alive in our daily relationship with God. Embracing the Prayer of Jesus Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man. Matthew 7, 24. I want to let you in on a secret. But you got to promise not to tell anybody. You see, I'm a golf addict. I might as well come right out and say it. I love golf. If there were such a thing as Golfers Anonymous, I would have enrolled in it years ago. For the better part of 40 years, I've worked hard at mastering the game I love. In the process, I have fallen for my share of faddish formulas that promise a better golf life in 30 days or your money back. I vividly remember falling hard for a book that promised to redefine how we play golf. The book promised rewards would come quickly and offered a seemingly endless stream of accessories from training aids to t-shirts. All I had to do was begin thinking about golf in a new and a better way. To top it all off, the book had fallen into my hands at just the right moment. Or so I thought. In less than a month, I'd be playing in a pro-am that precedes a nationally televised golf tournament called The Skins Game. The four contestants that year were Fred Couples, John Daly, Tom Watson, and Tiger Woods. It was reported that the tournament turned out to be one of the highest rated golf shows in national television history. <laughs> Needless to say, 
I desperately wanted to be in peak form. During the month before the tournament, I followed the proven techniques to a T and seemed to experience some amazing results. I even watched an infomercial laced with convincing testimonials from people whose golfing lives had been revolutionized. The credibility of the spokesman was impeccable. He was an accomplished golfer who essentially promised that this easy to remember formula had been the key to his own success. I became so convinced that I had finally found the secret, I passed the book around to several of my very best golf friends as well. At the dinner reception after the pro-am, I decided to ask Tiger what he thought about the secret. His reaction was classic. Before he even opened his mouth, the answer was obvious. Rather than taking Tiger's unspoken warning, however, I resolved I'd prove him wrong. I can still remember thinking, what does he know? In my defense, this was 1996, long before he had become the most recognized athlete on the planet. In time, however, I experienced what every player who has ever fallen for a fad experiences. Discouragement and disillusionment. Unless you've been living in a cave, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You may never have fallen for a newfangled faddish golf formula, but perhaps you have fallen just as hard for something else. Maybe it was the secret to a successful marriage, the secret to beating the stock market, or the secret to losing 30 pounds in 30 days. The list is endless. I bring this up because I want to make you a promise. The prayer of Jesus is not a passing fancy. It's the real thing. When Peter and the disciples expectantly begged Jesus for bread, he did not give them a stone. Diving in. I've had the experience eight times now, and every single time it was a struggle. As my children began to outgrow their diapers, I tried to talk them into leaving the kiddie pool and launch out into the deep. For them, however, the kiddie pool was all there was and all there ever would be. That, of course, is until they experienced the deep. Once they learned how to swim in the ocean, they forever lost their appetite for shallow water. As I led each one of my children into an experience with the vastness of the ocean, so too, Jesus led his disciples out of the shallow tide pools of prayer into an ever-deepening relationship with their Heavenly Father. The following are some practical guidelines for diving in. 1. Make the paradigm shift. Stop seeing prayer as merely a means of obtaining your requests. Start seeing prayer as a means of enjoying the riches of a relationship with God. In other words, learn well the facts, the F-A-C-T-S, the faith, adoration, confession, thanksgiving, and supplication on prayer that I presented in chapter 3. 2. Confess your sins daily. Every single prayer, including the prayer of Jesus, will bounce right off the ceiling if there's unforgiveness in your heart, which is precisely why Jesus ended his public sermon on prayer with these words. If you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will not forgive your sins. 3. Get into the Bible. God's will is revealed in His Word. Thus, the only way you can know His will is to know His Word. The more we meditate upon God's Word, the clearer His voice will be as we daily commune with Him in prayer. 4. Discover your secret place. The secret to prayer is secret prayer. Your public presence is a direct reflection of your private prayer life. If you spend time in the secret place, you will exude peace in the midst of life's storms. If you do not, <laughs> you're going to be a poster child for busyanity rather than Christianity. 5. Make prayer a priority. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. As the Master put it, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice or applies them is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. 
My experience in teaching memory for over two decades demonstrates that if you faithfully practice a new discipline for 21 days, it may well stay with you for the rest of your life. The Moment of Truth After my encounter with Tiger Woods at the Skins game, my golf swing continued to deteriorate. The moment of truth arrived when I went back to an old friend who had worked with me over the years on the fundamentals of golf. God had used me to lead him to faith in Christ. Now he was giving me a lesson. He watched me take just a few swings and knew immediately what the problem was. Hank, he said, choosing his words carefully, you love golf far too much to ever take another shortcut. Over the next few hours, Fred patiently reacquainted me with the basics. I was amazed at how quickly things fell back into place. Within weeks, I was playing the best golf of my life. As much as I love golf, I love God infinitely more. Golf is a hobby. God is my life. It stands to reason, therefore, that I'd put a whole lot more time and effort into learning the principles of praying than learning the principles of playing. Prayer is a beautiful foretaste of something that we will experience for all eternity. Paradise lost will soon become paradise restored and a whole lot more. For we will experience something not even Adam and Eve experienced, face-to-face communication with the very one who taught us the prayer of Jesus. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As you have heard today, many Christians struggle to spend time in prayer and treat prayer as something they have to do rather than something they want to do. But that is not at all what God intended for us. Prayer is an opportunity to speak directly with our Heavenly Father and experience His loving presence. You too can experience the joy of a healthy prayer life. Hank Hanegraaff has spelled out all that you need for effective prayer in The Prayer of Jesus, Secrets to Intimacy with God. You can request your copy of the two-disc audio CD set or softcover edition with study guide online at equip.org. That's equip.org. Or when you call our resource consultants at 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-274. You can also write to us at Post Office Box 8500, Charlotte, North Carolina, 28271. The Bible Answer Man broadcast is on the air because truth matters and is a production of the Christian Research Institute. Set sail for a week at sea with the Bible Answer Man, Hank Hanegraaff and the Word. This coming May 9th through May 16th, 2010. The seven-day Western Caribbean cruise departs from Tampa, Florida and sails to four beautiful Caribbean ports like Grand Cayman, Belize, and Cozumel aboard the luxurious Carnival Legend. Enjoy a time of great fellowship and daily teaching from God's Word with Hank. Grammy Award-winning Christian musician Steve Camp leads worship. The topic throughout our week will be the Word as we explore the unfathomable riches of the God-breathed scriptures and how we can apply these great truths to our lives. To participate in this event, you must register with our friends at Sovereign Cruises. Starting at just $599, cabins are going quickly. So register soon by calling 877-768-2784, extension 101, or by going online to equip.org. Don't all religions lead to God? What is truth? Aren't the Bible's views on homosexuality outdated? What's wrong with Wicca? Teens question everything. They need real answers. That's why Hank Hanegraaff has come out with the Bible Answer Book for Students. 
King took all the Q&As from Bible Answer Book 1 and 2 that are important to students and came up with real answers that make sense to us. 82 questions on topics that are on the minds of students today about God, the Bible, eternity, even social issues are covered, like stem cell research, capital punishment, homosexuality, and many others. The Bible Answer Book for students is perfect to share with your non-believing friends, those looking for spiritual answers, with new Christians, or for you. The Bible Answer Book for Students by Hank Hanegraaff. Order your copy. Call 888-7000-CRI. That's 888-7000-CRI. It's also available online at equip.org.